Hello folks, good morning, good afternoon, good evening everybody. Welcome to the uh, Universe Uniface webinar 2021, June. Um, well, we hope you have uh, as nice uh, weather as we have here in Amsterdam. It's uh, very sunny and uh, warm today, so uh, everybody is in a very good mood and we're looking forward to a very interesting program of today. Um, we have uh, uh, a nice uh, package of uh, presentations uh, for you. And of course, this is an online session. And uh, as um, hopefully also in your region, the COVID thing is uh, slowly but surely moving away. So we look forward to uh, to meet you all uh, again after summertime face to face. But uh, until that time, we'll uh, continue in this uh, online fashion. And today we have a program with uh, three major topics. Um, first of all, um, as you've heard uh, and as you've written uh, probably, um, the Uniface has a new owner, it's called uh, Rocket Software. Uh, second uh, session will be about uh, Blinked, a Dutch customer. And the third session will be about uh, Uniface and microservices and containerization architectures. But that, that's later, uh, later in the session. We'll start with um, a presentation by uh, our new owner, uh, Rocket Software. The presentation is done by uh, Jeff Winter. He's going to explain to you about uh, you know, who Rocket Software is, what they are, what they do. And of course, which impact this will have on, on Uniface or not. That's, uh, we'll hear from uh, Jeff about what's uh, going on there. So uh, without further ado, please, Jeff, take your time. Hello. 
My name is Jeff Winter, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Rocket Software. And I'm pleased to spend the next 10 minutes or so with you to give you a brief overview and introduction to Rocket Software. At Rocket, we like to say that legacy powers legendary. And what do we mean by that? We mean that legacy platforms, IBM mainframe, IBM Z, the IBM I platform, multi-value, and now Uniface, these legacy computing platforms provide the opportunity for users to create legendary outcomes for their customers and their partners. You know, 70% of the, of the workloads, the IT workloads worldwide run on these legacy platforms. So it's incredibly important that we invest, that we keep these platforms modern, and that we enable the growth and the development of the applications and business processes and data that sit on top of them to be modern and to enable innovation. Legacy powers legendary. A few facts about Rocket. We just celebrated our 31st birthday. We're headquartered outside of Boston, Massachusetts in the United States. We have thousands of customers and thousands of partners, offices around the world, and we have an engineering culture. You know, our founder and CEO, Andy Yunus, likes to say that Rocket was built to make great software, to write really good code. So we have an engineering culture that is steeped in everything that we do. And of course, our customer support is world-class and occurs 24, 7, and 365. I mentioned customers, and what you see on this slide is just an example of some of the customers that have trusted and invested in Rocket to help them run their most mission-critical business processes and applications. And you can see there are customers from almost every industry, banking, financial services, insurance, retail, government agencies, and more. And you can see there are customers of all sizes as well, some very large enterprises, enterprises but also some that are in the midsize. So depending upon what industry you are, no matter what industry you are or what company size you are, Rocket has solutions and technology that can help you. And when you work with Rocket, we like to talk about the Rocket experience. And that is kind of a holistic approach to how we work with customers, how we work with partners. And it really has three elements, the product promise, the customer commitment, and the Rocket values. So let me just spend a minute or so talking about each one of these. First is the product promise. As I mentioned before, our founder and CEO, Andy Yunus, likes to say our mission is to build great products. So you, as a user, as a consumer of this technology, you can expect that our products have a level of security, have been tested, are high quality, and meet the standards of a modern enterprise software company. And that these products will continue to be innovative and that it will continue to rely and have interconnectivity with other Rocket products. That's our product promise to you. And the customer commitment. This is once you are a Rocket customer and you have a question, you have an issue, you have a technology challenge, that we are going to be here for you, that we are going to answer the phone in a timely manner, that we are going to assign a single individual to your case that you are gonna tell us when that issue is resolved. We are not gonna tell you. We are gonna be available, as I mentioned before, 24, seven and 365. So our commitment to you as a Rocket customer will be to never let you down. And one of the things that I really love about Rocket, there is one tier of support. There isn't a premium and a basic or a silver and gold and platinum, because we believe that every customer deserves the same high level, white glove treatment in terms of customer support. That's our customer commitment. And last but certainly not least are the values. And I've been a rocket for almost two years now. And when I came and I saw the words empathy, humanity, trust, and love, I honestly had to scratch my head. How can an enterprise software company have these values? And I can tell you after being here for as long as I've been, they are true, they are real, and they drive everything we they, everything that we do as rocketeers. Empathy, you know, we always try to think about how our decisions will affect other Rocketeers or customers or product roadmap, partners, and humanity. And, and, you know, the last year and a half with COVID has really tested all of our humanity, but treating each other with dignity, with respect, and humanity is incredibly important for us. And trust, always do what you say you're going to do. Every conversation that we have, if we make a commitment, we are going to stand by it.
And last but not least is love. And this is, I think, my favorite value because what I've learned at Rocket is that we love other Rocketeers. We love our products. We love our jobs. We love what we do. Um, and so I hope that that translates into how we engage with customers and, and, and you um, uh, on an ongoing basis. So again, the Rocket experience, the customer commitment, the product promise, and our values. Let me shift gears and talk a little bit now about our actual products and our technology. And every company has their own version of kind of their view of the world. And, and ours looks like this on the left side of the slide. It's our technology stack. And you could work with Rocket and enter at any point in the stack. You don't have to start at the bottom and work your way up. This is just the way that we perceive the world. Um, the first level around core processing and subsystems, that's really the infrastructure. You know, is it running in a stable environment? Is it efficient? Is there proper load balancing? Is there cost optimization in your core IT infrastructure? That's really foundational and very important. Security. I mean, cybersecurity, IT security, it's, it's, if not on the top of the list, pretty darn close to the top of the list for every CIO and, in fact, every CEO um, in, in the world. It's incredibly important. So Rocket providing security products, but also making sure that our own products are secure and allow that level of security um, that, is, uh, that is so critical today. Data and AI. Uh, you know, the, the ability to make sure that, that your data is readily available, can be tapped into for real-time processing. If you're a financial institution doing credit card applications, you cannot afford a, for the, you cannot afford to have latency in those processes. So making sure that data is available and how to take advantage of that data to perform artificial intelligence and really gain the insights from all the data that is sitting on your IBM Z and IBM I um, and other multi um, and other platforms. Uh, incredibly important to be able to leverage artificial intelligence. I'm gonna skip over app dev just for a minute. I'm gonna come back to it because that's what Uniface is, uh, where it fits into our uh, technology stack, uh, open. So creating that open source and platforms and legacy systems require to modernize. I mean, there are so many tools and open source languages that customers can take advantage of to keep those modern, to keep those applications and business processes modern. But how do you support them? How do you make sure that they're reliable and secure? So we have a lot of offerings to go help take advantage of all the open source technology. And last but certainly not least is hybrid cloud. You know, I don't know if there is a single Rocket customer whose applications and business logic and data all sit in the cloud or all sit in, in an on-premise kind of behind the firewall scenario. It's a mix, it's a hybrid, right? So whether or not your business logic is sitting in the cloud and you have to, have to access data that might be sitting on an IBM mainframe behind a firewall or vice versa, where the data is sitting in the cloud and your business logic is, is on-premise, no matter what, we are building the connectors, the APIs, and all the tools and technology to make sure that you can access all the data you need and be able to run your processes in a hybrid environment. As I mentioned before, application development, that is what Uniface is all about. That's what multi-value is about. So we have a lot of history and capabilities in supporting platforms where application development is the core, the core piece, uh, the core value there. Um, and we are going to continue to invest in these platforms. We are going to continue to make sure that they stay modern and that we're investing in the tools and technologies and bringing all the experience that Rocket has had in this space of application development um, you know, to you as, as Uniface users. So we're really excited to, again, welcome Uniface to the Rocket community uh, and the Rocket family. I talked about our culture before and uh, just a couple of things that I wanted to emphasize. Number one is, again, we like to have fun. We, we, are, we like music at Rocket. Uh, in fact, the gentleman in the blue shirt with the guitar, he is our CEO and he's a very good guitarist. And over the years, there have been probably 100, maybe 110 Rocketeers that have participated in the Rocket band. And when this COVID thing uh, you know, settles down a little bit more, we hope to have another world tour of the uh, of the rocket band but it's real you can find us on youtube we actually play and uh we really enjoy it and then rocket build i mentioned that we are an organization with a really strong engineering culture so we have this program called rocket build it's a hackathon it's an internal hackathon that we launch and we have partners participate um we have external judges we work with students and universities and we take time 
to allow for innovation. So literally our engineers take days off to participate in Rocket Build. They form teams. Right now we're actually in the middle of it and we have about 150 teams across Rocket, cross-functional teams, not just engineers. Um, and this just is an example of how we are continually innovating and trying to just push the envelope um, and, uh, and innovate for, for our customers. So in summary, I would describe Rocket as an IT partner with a heart. You know, we have these core values of empathy, humanity, trust, and love that really drive everything that we do. And we are a company that is just, again, driven by innovation and driven by the ability and the desire to help produce and help you produce legendary outcomes using and leveraging the great technology in these legacy platforms. So with that, I really appreciate your time and hope you learned something about Rocket. Have a great day. Hey, Jeff, uh, thank you very much. I think it was a very uh, clear story. And of course, we have been uh, working with uh, Rocket uh, here in the Universe Lab now uh, for a couple of uh, months. And I must say, uh, the integration process is uh, very well on its way. And we have already established a very good relationship with many uh, Rocketeers. So um, we'll see some, uh, some nice things going forward uh, in the coming months about this. Of course, uh, I can imagine that you all have uh, quite a few questions uh, about, about yeah, what does Rocket mean for uh, for Uniface. Uh, please uh, put all your questions um, in in the chat, and we'll uh, we'll look very much forward to to answer them. And of course, in the meantime, uh, we will give you a little bit update about uh, what impact Rocket software will have on our uh, regular process of working with Uniface customers, and especially about uh, the support part of that. And yeah, of course, there's no better person in this uh, world than uh, Master of Support, uh, Jan Kees Bogaert, who is standing uh, next to me. <laughs> and uh, Jan Kees will explain to you about um, yeah, what uh, Rocket Software, our integration with them, means for Uniface support. Thank you, Tom. Yes, I will spend a few minutes on, on explaining uh, a bit what, uh, what Uniface uh, is under, uh, under Rocket Uniface support. Uh, I uh, the rocket support philosophy, well, in essence, very little will, will change. When we did our mutual introductions, it became very clear that the rocket support philosophy is, is very much in line with uh, the Uniface tradition of support, meaning that it's customer central. Uh, we work uh, customer specific. Customers determine uh, our, uh, how urgent things is. Customers determine our priorities. Expertise, we keep our uh, support engineers up to date to make sure that you are talking to somebody who has uh, in-depth uh, product knowledge. Uh, then personal contact, uh, also Rocket wants our customers to uh, work with, with people and not with some anonymous uh, entity. So as we are doing now, uh, a call is owned by uh, one engineer, stays with that engineer, so you don't have to explain time and time again what your issue is. Um, and I also know that many of you have established relationship with, uh, with our engineers, and we want to keep it like that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, future developments. There are plans to move our uh, Uniface uh, community to the Rocket environment, uh, being the Rocket Forum and uh, a personalized uh, support portal. Um, any content that is currently in uh, in the uh, sorry in the community will be migrated to the, the Rocket environment as well. Um, Detailed information on, on how uh, you can access it, etc., will be uh, shared with you in, in due time. Uh, that will not be the end of it. We will simply continue to uh, share information with you online as, as we are doing now. And then the last slide, please. On the short term, very little will, will change. The only thing that you will notice is that our email addresses will change from uniface.com to uh, rocketsoftware.com email addresses. 
That's also true for uh, the service desk uh, portal that we currently have. So you may want to whitelist that. And it's probably also good to know that uh, any email that you will be sending to our old email addresses will be forwarded to the new uh, email box. So your emails will not be lost. And that's really it, what I have to say now. Okay. Thanks, Jan Kees. Uh, again, a very clear story. Um, uh, one of the questions that we received, you mentioned that um, there will be changes uh, announced uh, in the near future. Do you already have an idea when that will be the case? Expectation now, it's always dangerous to answer that question, <laughs> yeah, no. but expectation is now uh, by the end of the third quarter. Oh, okay. So that that's, uh, will, will be after the summer time. Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, uh, customers can be guaranteed that they will get the same service as uh, they've had before. As uh, they did before. Okay. Okay, folks, so if you have any questions about what Jan Kees just mentioned, just, uh, please put it in, into the chat um, and we'll respond to that uh, yeah, immediately. Um, thanks, Jan Kees, okay. and uh, hope to see you You're soon. You're welcome. Um, our next uh, session will be uh, a story from uh, one of our uh, new Dutch uh, customers uh, called uh, Blinked. Uh, Blinked is a uh, what we call a value-added reseller, and uh, Blinked is uh, yeah brand new to the Uniface uh, uh, audience, um, they have uh, built a quite a complex uh, uh, application for local government, and uh, that has gone into production already last year with uh, yeah lots of new technologies they were able to use in Uniface and, and new architectures. But of course, uh, the best people uh, to tell that are the people from Blink to themselves, uh, uh, Patrick and uh, Richard. And um, yeah, here you go, guys. Please uh, show us what you got. Hello, my name is Erik Huber. I'm marketing manager of Uniface and I'm visiting uh, one of our very added resellers, uh, Blinked, in Ede, the Netherlands. Uh, I will be interviewing Patrick Smollers, the uh, managing director of Blinked, and uh, Richard uh, Bollet, IT director. And uh, I'm starting off with Patrick. Hello, Patrick. Hello, Erik. Nice being here. Can you tell us something more about Blinked? Yes, sir, of course. Good to have you here uh, because we're proud uh, to say something about Blinked. Uh, Blinked is a newly found, uh, founded company in 2014 and we are developing uh, IT services and IT, an IT application for the Dutch uh, market, especially for local governments uh, which are um, involved in executing legislation uh, for Dutch social affairs and employment and for healthcare. Okay, it sounds like a complex market. It, it, do you develop one? Uh environment or is it multiple applications? No, it's uh, uh, one single environment, but it's customizable for each local government. And that's because be between some boundaries, uh, every Dutch uh, local government has some uh, ways to execute uh, the legislation. Uh, so that's why it's uh, working completely different from growing until the south of Netherlands. Okay, you started in 2014. Did it take you long to build this environment? Uh, yeah, it took us about four years uh, to build the base foundation of, of the application. Uh, that's because the application is uh, quite complex. Um, we have to support uh, legislation from five different ministries, uh, but also it has live connections to uh, databases around the country, uh, like the tax office, like healthcare, like uh, housing department, uh, road uh, traffic department. Um, and it has also highly uh, privacy uh, information containing from every citizen uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, that's why we have lots of rules uh, to have to comply with uh, before the uh, before we can install and use the application. Okay. Okay. So the the Blinked application uh, is already three years in production. Uh, do we have a lot of customers? Uh, yeah, we but we took it slow. Uh, in 2017, uh, we took it with one customer, uh, one launching customer. That's because the application are that complex. Uh, the risk of failure is uh, extremely high. Mm -hmm. uh, after that year, we took another one in 2018. And at the moment, we are serving nine uh, local governments. Uh, and we are very proud that we just signed a contract with Groningen, uh, the sixth uh, city in the Netherlands. Uh, and we will be uh, transforming uh, or introducing our application and they will start working it from uh, the 1st of January 2022. 
Oh, congratulations with uh, Groningen. Uh, and thank you for the interview. Uh, we will continue with Richard, but first we will start with a demo of the application itself. In het instructiefilmpje gaan we laten zien hoe u de inkomsten vastlegt bij een uitgeënse rechter. Op het startscherm vindt u de personentegel. Binnen de personentegel vindt u een zoekvenster. In het zoekvenster kunt u gegevens ingeven om uw klant die u waar u de inkomsten bij wil monteren op te halen. Nadat de klant geselecteerd is, wordt het klantbeeld van deze klant geopend. Op het klantbeeld heb ik meerdere opties, waaronder de inkomstentegel. Door hier op toevoegen te klikken, wordt het invoerscherm geopend. Bij inkomstensoorten selecteer ik de soort inkomsten die het betreft. Ik kies eventueel of het voor de IOW EOZ inkomsten zijn. Dat komt omdat ik niet vanuit een uitkering werk, maar nu vanuit een persoon werk. Ik selecteer het bedrag, typ ik in. Of het inclusief of exclusief vakantiegeld is, de periodiciteit van de inkomsten geef ik aan en per wanneer de uitkeringsinkomsten ingaan. Dat kan ik doen door het scherm de datum in te vullen. Ik kan even ook het kalendertje gebruiken. Aanvullend kan ik hier een verstrekker-werkgever invullen en ik kan aangeven of de loonheffingskorting is toegepast bij het berekenen van deze uitkering. Dit is een gegeven wat natuurlijk noodzakelijk is bij het jaarwerk. Eventueel kan ik bepalen of het bedrag aan loonheffingskorting, als dat bekend is, dan kan ik dat hier ingeven. Zo niet, dan wordt het automatisch conform de rekening van de Belastingdienst bij het jaarwerk uitgevoerd. Ik kies op opslaan en vervolgens zijn de inkomsten toegevoegd en staan ze klaar om verrekend te worden bij de eerstvolgende uitkeringsberekening. Dit was het einde van deze instructie. You have just been watching the demo of Xworks, the major application of Blinked. Uh, Richard, can you tell me something more about the technical details of this application? I hope. Um, well, the application itself is uh, uh, primarily cloud-based. Uh, we, uh, we decided to go from a client-server uh, setup in, let's say, 2014-15 towards a cloud environment. So we created a cloud application uh, in the basis uh, that also can be run on-premise uh, at a local government office. Um, that has some challenges in itself. If you come from a uh, client-server environment, uh, some aspects are absolutely different from, uh, from client-server. Uh, the way of programming, uh, the way of stateless working, uh, the hit list mechanisms uh, for all the old dogs uh, between us uh, know what a hit list is. Um, you can't use that anymore. Uh, it's gone. Uh, so if you have a retrieve on a database, you have 10,000 records, you become 10,000 records. Whether you have a, a client server environment, you only get 10 or 20 or what kind of setup you have. So you have to think about all these issues, uh, the way of uh, retrieving your information, the way of presenting the information, um, you all have to take these aspects into account. Um, one way of, of searching, uh, we all know uh, Google from uh, the search engine uh, perspective. Uh, you just enter a few sentences, a few keywords, and you become your results back. Uh, whether they are valid or not, uh, you get some information presented to you. Mm -hmm. um, we incorporated uh, that same functionality within our applications within a few screens. So if you are uh, looking for uh, certain individuals or for uh, some uh, dossiers, you can just type in the information and then the search engine will retrieve that specific information for you. So that's interesting because that is actually old technology combined with uh, the new way of working that everybody is accustomed to on the internet. Okay. And do you lose a lot of, do you use a lot of struct in that? Internally, uh, not per se on that perspective, um, but we do use uh, structs in a way of uh, transferring information between the components uh, uh, internally. Um, a struct, what you can do with a struct is you can uh, pass this information by reference towards another component. Um, in the old situation, you pass parameters uh, between components and then it's 
more or less copied. So that will take a lot of time, especially when that information is yeah, rather big. If you have large strings, you have to transfer all that information towards your system, a bit uh, throughout your system. If you use structs, you do uh, a kind of reference information. Um, so every component that you have adds or retrieves information from that struct. So yes, it is very helpful. And are they easy to learn, those structs? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's not. It's um, uh, what you are accustomed to within Uniface is uh, a line, kind of codeless working. Uh, you have a very small uh, set of uh, instructions that you have. And what you actually do with structs is that you go low level into uh, a kind of information uh, that you can uh, build up. Um, so you uh, program your structs instead of uh, defining uh, and using what you uh, do in Uniface uh, by nature. So the way of programming is different, but it's very powerful and it, it is an add-on in, uh, in the Uniface uh, language itself. Okay, and how do they perform? Oh, great. Yeah, great, that, that's what I'm saying. Okay. If, if you have a um, uh, two components and you transfer information between these components. Uh, if, it, if you use it by reference in a struct, um, uh, less memory is being used and the memory that you put your information in is uh, on demand uh, available. Uh, so you don't have to copy, the memory usage is, uh, is less and the performance is, uh, I, I don't complain about it. It's, it's okay. good. Are you running Xworks in a cloud environment? Uh, yes, we are, uh, but not just in a cloud environment uh, where we do the hosting uh, and the monitoring, etc. Uh, we also um, have some implementations uh, on-premise, uh, on-site. And we also have a kind of mixed situation, a kind of hybrid situation um, in which we use uh, information systems uh, from the local government which are run on site and we are running in the cloud. But also uh, the vice versa way is possible that we run the application Xworks on premise and use some services from other providers uh, that are cloud applications actually. Okay. okay. I was just wondering uh, which version of Uniface are you using? Uh, I think, I think it is uh, version 974. Uh, it's not the latest, the latest version. Uh, we um, we cling to the paradigm, uh, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. So if it serves our needs, uh, we will stick to the version uh, at hand. We don't uh, install patch levels just because it's there. Uh, it has to uh, yeah, comply to our needs. Um, but therefore, uh, at this version, that is uh, stable enough for us. Um, but in the near future, we are migrating towards Uniface 10 point, whatever version is available. Are you planning to run Uniface in a containerized environment? That is um, in the plans for the near future. Um, and we were just talking about the, the version of Uniface. Yes, we are migrating towards Uniface 10. But for us, it's not only a uh, technology uh, migration to go towards a uh, better supported version by, uh, by Uniface. But it also has uh, some aspects in itself um, that we are trying to um, uh, make our own application more future-proof. Um, at this moment, we have uh, several customers running on several machines. So we are more or less looking towards the future. What can we do about this? Eh? Containerization is also a way of um, um, better um, deployment of your application, easier deployment of your application. Uh, but most important, it's scalable. Uh, the scalability, uh, if you get more customers on the same environment, you need to be scalable. Um, and containerization, containerization helps you uh, in, that, in that respect. Um, but then again, containerization is, is not uh, a key thing. Eh? What you need to do is you have to prepare your application uh, first 
so that you can uh, put the containers around some fragments uh, of your application. Yeah, you have a kind of functional decomposition of your application first, then you can containerize uh, these small parts, and then you can decide, okay, which uh, container do I need uh, five instances of, and of which another we need uh, 10 or 20, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, would you describe the future architecture as uh, Microsoft's architecture? Um, I guess, yes. Um, what we are doing now is we try to decompose our application in functional parts. And these functional parts you can consider as containers. So multiple containers side by side, you can think about these containers as uh, autonomous parts. These combined uh, from cont container type number A, you have four instances. For container type B, you have uh, 20. All these containers together, uh, yeah, you can say that is a microservice architecture. You just uh, were talking about decomposing your application. Yeah. Uh, do you need to de decompose much uh, in your application to make it uh, ready for microservices? Um, yes. Yes, you, you, you have to think it over what kind of uh, services you would like to uh, deploy in the near future. Uh, uh, you can think about batch service. Uh, we have a, a web service engine for the communication uh, for us between all the, the parties that we uh, have to communicate with. Um, we have um, a rule engine in place uh, for all that flexible solutions that Patrick was already uh, talking about so that every gover local government organization can implement their own needs. Um, these are all small components that we have to uh, not break up that that is a big word uh, but then again you have to get them loosely coupled uh, so that it's not uh, yeah it's uh, spaghetti in concrete <laughs> it's badly translated but <laughs> it's a it's a dutch uh, saying so uh, hey it has a lot of uh, uh, stuff in dependence uh, dependencies uh, in it and um you have to um, yeah, um, split your application in functional parts. That's the most important thing. How far you go uh, in, in that de decomposition, it's up to every uh, organization for themselves. You can uh, say, uh, if I have uh, an authentication module, and authentication modules for us, it's a, a connection to uh, the government uh, itself. Uh, every citizen uh, has uh, a, a SOFI number, a burger service number, as we call it here in the Netherlands. Um, and he can log on to a service called DigiDay. You can isolate that process uh, that the user uh, uses to log on to your application um, as a autonomous service. Um, you have um, the same principle uh, idea for companies. Um, so uh, a herkenning uh, is in the Netherlands used uh, for companies to have a business-to-business -business, uh, communication. Uh, then you have your on-premise uh, uh, user that logs on to yeah, uh, Microsoft uh, Azure uh, to authenticate themselves. Um, you can isolate that, but then you have three small parts. Mm -hmm. Or you say authentication is one module. Uh, so it's the, all the functional decomposition, uh, the, the, the levels, uh, how deep you go and how far you go, how far you take that, it's up to the organization uh, themselves. Uh, we decided uh, that that is part of uh, the, the core of XWorks, uh, so we need it and that uh, specific part. And so you're going to build uh, different kinds of microservices around the Uniface application? It's not around the Uniface application. It is using Uniface application. So our batch engine uh, will be a different service from uh, uh, our web services uh, part. But it's all already in Xworks. So we take parts out of Xworks and isolate and containerize those specific uh, uh, yeah, functional functions. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And talking about Unifest replication, mm -hmm. what functionality do you like best in the in our application? Well, uh, we we go a long way back within Uniface. Eh? For me, if, if I speak for myself, I have more than 30 years of experience uh, with Uniface. What I always liked about Uniface is uh, the simplicity of the language. Eh? You don't have too many statements, and that is a big plus. You don't have to learn a lot. Eh? Uniface takes a lot of out of your hands and just provides you with the functionality. Um, one of the key features that we use within the application that is a major pro for us um, is the use of uh, conditions and expressions. And they are, these are two small statements uh, within the whole dictionary of, of Uniface that we use a lot just to provide that functionality that we need on a local government level. Uh, you can code as many code as you want, but if you can add functionality in a flexible way, and you can use these two statements to provide the functionality that our customer needs. That's great. Okay, oh, that sounds good. And uh, what kind of functionality do you still miss in version 9.7? <laughs> yeah, I, I cannot talk about Uniface uh, 10. That, that would be inappropriate. Um, one of the the, 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 the the big pluses in, in using structs, uh, we talked about it earlier, is that you can uh, pass uh, a struct by reference. This means you, you pass on a kind of pointer on the information that you need. Every other component, uh, every other parameter, I, I should say, um, is already by value. So if you pass parameters by value, it gives you a, a, an enormous um, load of, of, of memory um, that you need to reserve on every component that you put that information in. So that is, if, if I would say, uh, what could be a, um, a beneficiary for Uniface, um, provide more of these parameters by reference and not only a struct, but also a string or whatever. Um, and that's one of the, the, the things that we work with every day uh, and that would yeah, benefit us as well. Um, yeah, one other key feature is more or less uh, in the near future, but then again, you're talking about Uniface 10 because that is the migration process, is the monitoring and be able to uh, get feedback from the application towards monitoring systems. Eh? We use uh, uh, Zabbix uh, for the monitoring of our application, but you can think about uh, other tools as well. Nagios, I think uh, Microsoft has also a kind of monitoring tool. And what I can tell now is that we need to be um, providing applications in place uh, just to get the information out of the application. So I would like, I would like, um, uh, that the application that we provide to our customers is more able to interact with the environment that it runs in. Okay, Richard, thank you. Uh, if you can you give one tip to uh, other Uniface developers? Free tip, always. Um, what we experienced uh, over the last uh, few years is that uh, the environment that you run your application in is changing, changing a lot. Uh, um, all the interfaces that we have within our application are more or less uh, SOAP XML based. Uh, what you see now is a, a tendency that it goes away towards a REST API. So you have to learn JSON. You know what JSON is um, besides XML. You have a web application, so you are uh, confronted with JavaScript, HTML, cascading style sheets. Uh, but then again, you have uh, database technology in place. So you have a lot of uh, online databases, uh, look at an Azure environment. So mm -hmm. you see that the, um, the complexity of the uh, environment that your application might run into um, is changing. Uh, what I would say, uh, yeah, support it, uh, uh, embrace it. It's all your, also your future. Uh, don't. Uh, cling to the things that you know, uh, the old dog knows his trick, uh, mm -hmm. that will be gone in 10 years. You have to move forward as a Uniface developer as well. 
and uh, there is a lot of uh, stuff surrounding your application. Um, we encountered it, uh, yeah, like I said, uh, from uh, a few years ago to, until now, and it's still changing. Thanks, Richard, for this interview and having me here at Blinked. I hope you enjoyed this interview and thanks for watching. Take Richard's tips in consideration and hope to see you next time. Hey, thanks, uh, gentlemen, uh, for your uh, information in this uh, nice interview uh, done by uh, Eric and Richard and uh, Patrick. Uh, I think a lot of uh, interesting information, especially about uh, yeah, building a very um, uh, relevant and modern architectures, Uniface applications with the uh, technology that Uniface is offering uh, right now as we speak. So uh, many things uh, also for, I think, existing uh, applications to, to implement. And uh, talking about that, I think uh, a lot of people have been reading a lot about uh, uh, Uniface and microservices and microservices and Docker and containerization. And hey, that's the next topic. Uh, a demo um, followed by a panel discussion by our uh, people from the Uniface lab who have been working on this topic very uh, much in detail um, for our own benefits and of course, specifically for the benefits of our customers to introduce possibilities to uh, the Uniface in containers by using microservices. Well, what are these and uh, how can you use them with Uniface? That's all gonna be explained by uh, Gerton, one of our main uh, Uniface architects and engineers. And after that, um, please raise all your questions in the chat as much as possible uh, and we'll answer them on the spot. And of course, during the panel session, which will be followed by the demo. Okay, guys, go ahead. Welcome to the webinar about Uniface in the world of microservices. My name is Gerton Leidecker, software architect and product owner in the Rocket Uniface Lab in Amsterdam, and I'm assisted by cloud expert and DevOps engineer, Alad van Berkel, who will help me with the cloud side of things. After this webinar, there will be a live session where our product manager, Mike Taylor, and our cloud architect, Marlon de Boer, will try to answer any questions that you might have around microservices, deployment in the cloud, Docker, Kubernetes, and what more. So submit any questions that you have in the chat and any questions not answered are still collected and we get back to you uh, at a late, later moment. So what are microservices? Microservices are not tiny Uniface service components. Although I could imagine that for some of us gray Uniface guys, it is the first thing that comes to mind. However, microservices is a design pattern and a runtime deployment model where you decomponentize your monolithic application in smaller pieces. And these smaller pieces are called microservices. From a development point of view, the microservices design pattern is comparable with component-based design, where you isolate functionality into a single component and where that component has a very clear and distinct interface. But where components or in Uniface terms, component instances still run in the same process, a big process with a lot of component instances in it, microservices run in their own process. So you would end up with a whole bunch of processes surfing, surfacing the same application. That's the big difference between components and microservices. From an application architecture point of view, this means a set of components that functionally implement a module of your application are put together into a single microservice or in Uniface terms, in, into a single U-server environment, potentially with its own database and its own WRD and web server. Obviously, communication between microservices is different from communication between Uniface component instances. Typically with microservices, you try to have a very loosely coupled communication, stateless, short transactions, no open hit lists, no ex explicit data descriptions, descriptors if that is not needed. The more loosely coupled the microservices is, 
the more you can make use of the power and the flexibility of the cloud in which microservices are typically deployed. The experiment that we did in the Uniface lab, because of its flexible deployment model, Uniface should be an excellent player in the world of microservices being deployed in the cloud. In the lab, we wanted to know whether this is actually true. So we started a research project. And this demo is an update on that project. So the demo application. So to test this in the lab, we built a demo application and we're looking at it here at the screen. So you can see it's a, it's a web shop like uh, checkout part of a, a web shop. Uh, it has orders here and order lines over here. And within the order lines, we should typically see some product details that you have on your shopping cart. Apparently something is wrong there because we get all sorts of errors. So we need to ask a lot what is going wrong here. Uh, the reason why it might go wrong is because the, the, the microservice that is service, the product area is apparently not working or whatever. There's another section over here, which is also served as a separate microservice and that's customer details. But apparently that thing is also not working because we have also an error over here. So we need to ask Allard to fix that for us. We're gonna do that in a minute. First, let me guide you uh, through the runtime architecture of this application. So it all comes together in one web screen, which is served by the SP, which is served by the order microservice. I'm gonna show you this picture a little bit bigger so we can actually see it. So here we have our browser. It's going through a Kubernetes, uh, going to a Kubernetes cluster. And there, um, this microservice basically serves the, 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 the main web page and the whole thing around order and order lines. Now we can see that um, from this server, we are calling another microservice to get the product details. So this is the product details microservice. And also when I click uh, the order link on the page, the browser itself directly communicates to a third microservice, which one is this, this, what is a purple, purplish kind of thing, um, which should provide the customer details. But apparently that thing is also not working. So our current situation is that this microservice is working, but the green one and the purple one at the bottom are not working. Now, as an example, we, um, um, a reason to split up certain um, pieces of your application into separate microservices is because they are actually served by third, third party products. For example, your whole customer service backend could have been provided by some sort of Salesforce backend, right? And by using a microservice in between, you can make that connection to third party microservices very easily. So that's a reason. So we have noticed that actually bits of our application are not working, the order, uh, the products and the customer. And we're gonna ask Allard now to fix that for us. Allard, can you uh, help me out with this? So let's have a look at the product issue that uh, Gertel has. Uh, it's running in a different uh, RESTful API than the order and the customer thing. Uh, so let's have a look at the deployments and what the issue is. So here we can see we have three RESTful APIs in Tomcat. We have a customer RESTful API. We have a order RESTful API in Tomcat and a product Tomcat. And uh, what we can see at the product Tomcat is that we have zero out of zero uh, pods running. So that will be the issue. Uh, we should scale it up to one and then it should be fixed. So. So let's scale it up to one replica. And as we can see here, the deployment product Tomcat has been scaled. We'll have a look at the output now. And we will see that one out of one Tomcat is running. So let's get back to Gerton and see if it works now. 
thanks, it should work now. So let's check that. I'm going to refresh the page. And let's see what happens. And we now indeed see that as part of the order lines, we now have product details, which are provided by this third or second, whatever you want to call it, um, separate, separate dedicated microservice for products. But we still have another one to go, because if I click this one, we still have this error for customer details. So I'm going to ask my mate again to help me fix this. Alar, if you please. So let's have a look at the issue Gertrude has now. Uh, the customer part of the site is not working. Uh, so let's see what the issue of the customer RESTful API deployment is. So as we already mentioned, we have three RESTful APIs running. That's the customer Tomcat, the order Tomcat, and the product Tomcat. Uh, in this case, we see that the customer Tomcat has zero out of one pods running. So indeed, it won't work. So let's see at the pod status uh, why it's not working. So here we see the customer Tomcat has an issue with the Im uh, image pool. So it says error image pool. Uh, this means that it can't pull the image from the registry. So let's have a look at the deployment, uh, what we did wrong with the image. So let's scroll down to the image part. And there we see the registry URL that's coming from GitLab. And then we see that the, the end of the URL has Tomcat1 latest. And we know that we use Tomcat latest normally. So let's remove the one and see if this will fix uh, the issue that Gertrude has. So here we see that the deployment has been edited. Let's see at the pod status what it's doing. Here we see that it's creating the pod. And now we see that the customer Tomcat pod is running. So let's get back to Gerton to see if the site is really working. Okay, I think it should be uh, complete and fine now. After Alat has done his magic, so I'm gonna click the customer ID now we see Buzzy, that's a good indicator. Yeah, so here we have now the customer details, which are served by a third microservices. And that makes sense to do it actually like that. Because uh, splitting up parts of your application in smaller microservices, and the smaller, the better, allows you to scale up and down those bits when needed. So from a application development and architecture point of view, it is good to immediately start organizing your application in smaller microservices so that you have later on the ability to deploy your application and start tweaking with your uh, whatever kind of runtime environment that you're going to use in the cloud. In our case, we use Kubernetes um, to start tweaking where you want to noodle around with um, having more pods, pods to serve that microservice and have less pods where you don't need them. So to explain that a little bit more, what we see here in every microservice, basically, um, we see four pods, as, as, as they are called. So we have um, the user for pod, which is this thing, and that's the, typically the thing that you're going to scale up if you need more, because that is running your 4GL Uniface business logic. You have the web server pod, including the WRD. You're going to scale it up if you actually have a lot of web resources to resolve, and you just need more of those. And the other ones are basically the same. Um, and in front of all of them, there is what is here called SVC. That is not a uniface surface. It's a load balancer. You put, plug that in between a pot, and this thing allows um, switching up and down pots when needed. 
Still in Kubernetes configuration, you have the ability to control the amount of pods that are running so that you can keep control on the cost and that it does not go well because you are probably running in commercial cloud. So keep an eye on cost is always a good thing. So our findings. Is this the best way to set up a Kubernetes environment? Maybe, maybe not. But while working on this, it became clear that it really depends on the type of application and where you need the flexibility to scale up and down. It, become, it became obvious that the smaller your microservice, the more flexibility you have in setting up pods and add the ability to tweak and tune the moment you need it or you realize that you need it. Yeah. So start with that as of the beginning in your application architecture. So for us in the Universe Lab, we have learned that on itself, it works. Um, but there are a number of things that we can improve to make the life of our customers being you a little bit easier. We have learned that configuration is complex. A lot of knowledge is needed about the application itself, the cloud, Docker, Kubernetes, and what more, including even Uniphase deployment. And that is something that we even might help a little bit more. We are now thinking on, for example, um, distributing Uniphase Docker images, which are fully pre-configured to work in an environment like Kubernetes out of the box. That would make life a lot easier. So we will continue with that research and see where it will end up. And maybe we're gonna do some other stuff as well, like generating some best practices, um, maybe some e-learning or what more. We're not done yet, that's for sure. So that's it. We have given you a quick peek of Uniface in the world of microservices, design pattern, and that it is a good pattern to follow if you want to move to the cloud and set up a scalable cloud environment using, for example, Kubernetes. Next, there's the session with Mike, Marlon, and Jorge as mediator. So if you have any question, post them in the chat and we'll, they will try to answer them. Thank you for watching. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this panel about microservices with Uniface and containers. I'm honored to be accompanied by Mike Taylor, our product manager, and Marlon De Boer, the cloud architect. And we'll be trying to answer your questions. I saw that Ian wanted to see the code. Well, this was the demo. We'll talk about that later. To start with, I would like to send a poll question to you because we want to know what you're thinking about that. The question is, are you planning to deploy your Uniface application in containers? And the poll question will appear in a minute so you can answer and we can get the feedback while we start working with this. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, Mike and Marlon are with us and we want to ask the first question to Mike about um, our product. Uh, what's the line of thought of Uniface and containers, Mike? I mean, uh, you know, looking at current development practices and deployment practices, you know, um, and Uniface in particular, when you're talking about enterprise scale applications, you know, uh, scalability is something that's really important to us. We, we want to be able to create, produce applications which match the customer's needs and scale easily using the Uniface architecture. So, you know, we have to create a solution that allows that to happen. Yeah, so currently we can vertically scale, we can run up on big machines. However, you know, horizontally scaling is the way that everything is going. So containerization and, and, uh, and breaking your application up um, and being able to independently scale parts of your application is a really important thing that we have to offer our customers. So that's what we're looking at. Thank you, Mike. Very good. Um, Marlon, why did we do this? Uh, microservices demo. How does that tie to what Mike just told us? Uh, you can uh, quickly get an overview of what Uniface is capable of also in the, in the so-called modern world. Uh, you see that the product is suitable to run in microservices. We've shown that it's running in Docker and in this case also with the orchestrator, Kubernetes, which gives you a lot of features out of the box uh, that run in a, in a, a modern uh, cloud environment. Yes, and, and we see that as the answer from our poll question. 72% uh, of our viewers are said 
15% uh, uh, of them that they are planning to do containers and 57 that are considering containers in the future. So it's, uh, it's an important uh, thing. Yeah, it's an important thing. Um, what's the situation with... Uh, My eyes are not so good, so I have to. Uh, uh, so what I and we need to talk about the the next aspect of um, container containerization, and we we did a demo mm -hmm. now, and we deployed microservices in three containers as Herton and Arla showed us. Is there any impact on the licensing, Mike? Uh, Docker is always going to is is a challenge when it comes to licensing because each of the containers in internally looks pretty much similar to each other. So being able to to license it properly is something that we're having to concentrate on. It's one of the reasons why we've looked looking at moving away from DLM and going to Sentinel to allow us to be able to do it. So some of the things uh, we're looking at is whether it is possible, and it it does seem to be very possible that what we do is we go for a scaling approach rather than a per server approach. Because with con Docker containers, they're gonna be small and a lot of them. Yeah, and that's a very different thing to having a big server that allows you to be able to scale your application. So we're looking at um, sort of, instead of uh, individually licensing Docker containers, uh, we're looking at instead um, licensing the number of you servers that can be used across your infrastructure. Yeah, okay. so going to a much more concurrent based approach on the server based licensing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm. um, Marlon, the, ne the next one is for you. There's been some comments that we uh, only do REST and you, uh, HTTP with Uniface for our microservices. Um, how do you see that? Is that the only option? Do we have more alternatives? What are your recommendations? Um... Well, we did the demo with only HTTP and REST, uh, but Uniface also have some other protocols. Uh, we're currently still investigating because for us, it's only also a learning uh, curve. Uh, we we te are testing this locally and internally. But my guess is that we, we can support the other protocols as well. Uh, but what you do see in a cloud environment that is typically uh, based on http request and i think that's the way to go uh, especially with microservices to break up your uh your different logic in api and make it more scalable that way and i think http is a great protocol for that yeah and we were also focusing according to herton and Alat, what we were trying to do is also do it in a loosely coupled way so that was what suited us in this demo i think so yeah. Okay, well, I think that's also a, a great value for the customers, right? You can have different teams working on code. Uh, you can have sprints in, in, in different settings. So it, it opens up lots of possibilities in, in, instead of having one big code base. Yeah, and but we have more. And I guess, Mike, you can elaborate <laughs> on this. So what we need to be able to do is not just be able to scale a Uniface application. We need integration in there as well. As more and more things become microservices in themselves, we want to be able to supply to them and consume them themselves. So that would be done through some kind of generic protocol, something like HTTP, yeah? However, uh, Uniface has a, a lightweight protocol that runs underneath, which has been there forever. And, you know, if we're looking at communicating between Uniface components, well, you know, that would be a very good option. But if you're looking at being able to share it, then perhaps you have to look at uh, more consumable uh, protocols which are much more industry standard. Okay. And um, Ian mentioned about um, women in in Uniface. We have uh, enough women working with us, and they're <laughs> here. They're unfortunately they didn't make it for this webinar, not presenting. But next next time we'll talk to Eric about that. So mm -hmm. don't worry about that. Um, some other questions. Um, what would you recommend, Marlon, for someone that's starting? from to do microservices and what we are providing. Because I think the solution that was presented by Herton and Ala, Ala was based on a Uniface Docker image. So you presented two of them. But, but That's what... not totally true because okay. there was more. We had the orchestrator in place already. So it's based on Kubernetes. Uh, that's the, currently, as we see, the, the industry standard to, to use uh, for orchestration. So, um, how I would see it, 
to start with microservices, uh, do as uh, less possible uh, yourself and use the tools uh, that are provided. So we're currently looking, uh, we're internally testing with Docker images. We're looking if we can provide those on a uh, public registry. And we're also looking into uh, providing uh, orchestration uh, tooling uh, with Kubernetes. So we're, we're thinking maybe of Helm or at least uh, manifest files for Kubernetes to get you started. And you can alter them. Uh, so th that are the current uh, possibilities we're, we're looking into. Okay, thank you, uh, Marlon. Uh, Mike, Luciano is asking, what about mixing and matching uh, Uniface and non-Uniface microservices? So, I mean, Uniface has always had a very good ability to be able to consume and also supply through uh, industry standard APIs. So, for instance, REST. So exactly what uh, was done in the demo, that would be a really good way of being able to share it with, with other uh, non-Uniface components. Yeah, um, you would expect all the function, all the standard uh, integration points which are available in the standard product to be there available in, in the containers as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, now we're getting also into very technical questions, Marlon, <laughs> yes, because sure. now is they're talking about uh, how do should we handle transactions and what does that get? It, how does that get involved into the microservices? So, can you? Give some thoughts, uh, ideas. Yeah, we, we've done some investigation uh, with database transactions because I guess that's the, the yeah, kind database of transactions, transactions exactly. we're talking about, just to be clear. Uh, so uh, what we found out from research is that scaling up is easy. Uh, your number of parts increase in the, in the case of Kubernetes. Uh, but scaling down can be an issue because if you just shut down your container without uh, cleaning up your outstanding requests, you get uh, data loss in production. So again, um, I would recommend Kubernetes because there are some nice hooks there. Uh, for example, you can have, uh, when you scale down your pod, you can uh, use all kinds of hooks to safely uh, let the pod finish its transactions and then be kicked out of the load balance or another setup you have. So uh, long story short, uh, it's still usable with transactions the way uh, you would do in a VM, only maybe you need uh, a bit more of tooling around. So that's a standard development on that. Mike. So, and if we're looking at uh, transactions within the application itself, yeah, you have to, yeah, have to be conscious of, of making sure that you are not committing things too early. So one of the popular ways of being able to do it is uh, service A uh, will do its updates and store, but not commit at that point of time, make a cross boundary call over to the second uh, microservice, which will do its thing. And if it fails, it will return back to the first one to roll back. Or if it passes, it does its commit, goes back to the, f uh, the first one, and then does it, which does its commit then. In that way, you protect your transaction or the scope of the, the request. Yeah. Yeah. Face commit, in other words. <laughs> Indeed. But I mean, it's, it's a big topic. It's, it's something that you have to consider as part of doing your, your microservices. And there are some really useful resources on the website, on websites, which do explain the, the philosophies about how you can maintain them transactions across this, the, these disparate uh, microservices, different machines. Well, now the, the, they have a question, and I think you both uh, might have uh, a thought about this. And people are saying that microservices or developing microservices might negatively affect the performance of the application. Um, who wants to start first on their thoughts about it? Yeah, I would like to start first. Okay, Marlon, <laughs> go for it. I think it's just the other way around. Uh, you can uh, better scale your application if you divide it in microservices, for example, uh, if you have a peak load on a Monday uh, afternoon uh, and that's based on one part of your microservice, you don't have to scale up your monolith, but you just scale up that part. Um, and maybe the, the thing I can think of that might cause a bit more latency is that you're using, for example, TCP be between different pods that would otherwise be locally, but in modern networks, the latency, uh, if you use cloud or on-premise, I think it, it's not neglectable uh, in terms of scalability. Okay. That's my uh, opinion on it. 
Okay, thank you, Marlon. Mike, any thoughts about why microservices would affect negatively the performance of the application? Um, no, I mean, I, I completely agree with what Marlon said there. Um, you know, the, the, the standard ways of being able to do things, you know, they, they are pretty optimized and you can get good throughput. Um, I think you have to, you have to look carefully at how you break up your application and what goes into each of the microservices. However, you know, I think that it, it is well possible to be able to get a very uh, scalable and performant application. Um, and I think, it, you know, if done properly, you can certainly get uh, big benefits from going into a microservice approach. Thank you. Uh, another question that I, I'll target you, Marlon, on okay. this one, because it's a very generic question. It says that uh, it is asking if the microservices are stateless, stateless or not. I think it's yeah that depends on your own implementation i would say the way to go for microservices is that your containers are stateless and all the stateful data you put outside your container because uh in cloud uh, um, the tendency is that your pods can restart more often than you would do with your own premise vm because if you scale up pods may uh, end up in different nodes in the cluster that causes a restart so it's good practice to have your uh, your containers in a, a stateless uh, state. Okay. This is a question that's coming from me. In our demo, we saw the presentation of uh, three microservices. One thing that was highlighted in the presentation from Herton and explained by Alec is that we were using Docker, Uniface Docker images. Why? Was that emphasis put there? Why, what, how does it help? Does it facilitate deployment? What should I think about that? I'll start with you, Marlon, and then okay. I'll give the word to Mike. Uh, the, the, the main benefit there is that you don't have to package your Univase uh, version yourself anymore. Uh, the, the, we do the quality insurance as well. We test it, so you don't have to do that anymore. It's easy to swap versions. Uh, we, with Docker, you can tag specific versions. So if you want the 10.3 release or 10.4, uh, you can just easily switch, uh, so it's easy to develop or have production another release. Uh, yeah, it, it saves the customer a lot of work. Okay, thank you, Marlon. Mike, I mean, we want to get to the point where it, it's uh, really easy to be able to deploy your application in a containerized environment. Yeah, um, and that means that. You know, we want to you know, ideally we want to get to the point where you know you hit a button inside of the Uniface development environment and we can then generate a uh, container which can be or is deployed within um, within the uh, your infrastructure made live. Okay, uh, that requires us to be able to get to the point where we are supplying images which can be used in order to be able to do that, and that you know that gives us consistency. It gives customers consistency as well. You know, we're a little way away from that. That's not something that's going to be out in, in version number one. So we're looking for useful points along the way uh, so that we can release and make it available to customers as early as possible. Yeah. However, our, our end goal is to make it as easy as possible for people to be able to, to do it. Okay. Now, thank you. Thank you both for your answers. I think it relates because deploying an application has its effect. So having this facility, it will make it easier for anyone because you take one hurdle out of the way, so that's good. Before continuing with answering the questions, I would like to go to another poll question, and that's how do you feel about Uniface in Docker images to help deployment? Uh, what we just talked, and then uh, you will see the question popping up, so please give us your answers so that we get a feeling how we're moving along those lines. Uh, another question that came through while people are answering, Marlon, is how is security arranged? And how does that relate to the components in, in, in these microservices? Yeah, still, uh, the, the customer itself has the responsibility to set up uh, security, of course. Uh, if you go to the cloud, for example, if I take the major ones, AWS, Azure, and, uh, and Google, they have all products like firewalls, security groups, which you need to enable yourself to best suit your own application. Uh, but again, if you choose for orchestrators, Kubernetes on top of the uh, of the cloud environment, you get tooling to easily uh, set up your security. Uh, but it will be different like you are used to on-premise. Uh, if you have, for example, a hardware load balancer where you do security rules, uh, 
the cloud load balancer will look slightly different, but also even more easy to automate, in my opinion. Okay, I'm going to give it a twist to that question, and that's what actually Harold was asking, is how is Uniface dealing with security and compliance when you are doing this deployment? Um, okay, so I'm going to answer the question I think was asked. Okay. And it was, <laughs> Uh, you know, when you have got multiple Docker containers, how do you maintain security across them? Yeah. Uh, so the standard way of doing this in kind of microservice kind of environment is by using something like a, a JWT. So you have a a, um, a container which is your security container, and then once you've been authorized, that content that uh, token is then passed between the different containers to make sure that you are authorized in each of the microservices to do what you're meant to be doing. Uh, I believe that there's been a couple of demos which have happened on that. Uh, so I think the uh, I think Peter Lammersma on the Uniface Universe last year, he did a presentation on it, and I believe that the the source code is being made available on GitHub. So you should be able to get hold of that and to be able to in integrate that into a project. Okay, thank you. Uh, we got the answers back from our poll question, oh. and I think you will like to, oh, to okay. hear that uh, people are delighted. To, have, to Uniface to help them with Docker integration and with Docker images for mm -hmm. the deployment. 56% uh, they just love it. 43% um, they don't know, so they, they, they need to figure it out. So that's very good. So we are in a high range. So that's uh, no, not but, down for the bottom. Well, it says 0%, but it's, it doesn't make up, it doesn't add up okay. because the other two make 99. So, well, let's leave it at that. Um, so it's obviously the right thing. Yeah, so it's we're, we're heading in the right direction and doing these investigations. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I know and I want to congratulate you both because I, you participated in the Rocket Build. Um, mm -hmm. That's a hackathon and teams have been developing things. And Mike's team did micro uh, deployment from the development point of view and develop uh, and deploy microservices. And they have made it to the final. And Marlon's team was also doing something with um, more the cloud and you were thinking more of a SaaS solution. So uh, congratulations to you both. Uh, so in October, we'll hear more about your progress. It's all about cloud and containers. So the gentlemen are knowledgeable. So throw your questions at them if you want. So, um, well, I think there, I, I have to resource to one of my questions because there is a bit of discussion here. <laughs> um, so um, the next thing is what kind of, development uh, facilities would you expect to do microservices? And you can take it, any of you. In Uniface, I mean, of course, because it would be domain-driven, as uh, Herton explained, domain-driven development to do microservices. Would we have something? Does any way of helping? Any thoughts about that? Yeah, I would say, like the demo already showed, the. the I think the, the Docker images uh, with Uniface containing it will greatly help. And along the way, uh, uh, you already mentioned a few options. Uh, the Kubernetes examples uh, or even the SaaS uh, solution as an end state, you know, uh, it will take away all the, the, the complexities of deployments for customers and they can focus on writing code and get it out there as quickly as possible. That's the tooling or the development tools I would see that would be greatly benefit. Uh, okay, that's from the technological aspects yeah. and now from Uniface because you build that also. So uh, any ideas, Mike? So I'm I'm in the moment liking the idea of having some kind of uh, a a project and the abilities within the project to be able to say uh, just deploy the contents of this project into a a, a Docker container. Um, and for that to be uh, possibly pushed up into uh, the cloud in some way. Uh, that's what our, our rocket build was. We had a build pipeline. Uh, we built the UARs. We collected all the assets needed for a web application. Uh, we pushed it into a Git repository, which um, made it available uh, in, I think it was GitLab, uh, where it, it then built the containers and deployed it in and made it live. Yeah. And it was a fairly seamless activity. So we we yeah uh, we just basically had Uniface project, the ability to be able to pick uh, a web root directory and a button to say go do it. Oh, good, very good. I think I, I like it. 
sounds uh, something we would like in the future. <laughs> no, not making any promises here. <laughs> uh, could you tell us a bit more about what you did? Because yeah, you sure. also use pipelines and some yeah. of the concepts that Mike just mentioned, they just ring a bell. Yeah, but we, we try to make it more generic. And uh, for us, we, we, uh, we wanted a cloud environment because uh, Mike's solution is a bit more flexible also to use on-premise. Uh, there is no competition, okay? <laughs> no, there is. <laughs> oh, there is. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different angle. Let's say it like that. Let's put it like that. So uh, what we did, we decoupled the Uniface um, runtime from the, the actual compiled uh, code, the UR. So uh, in our case, uh, we also had a, a package registry. We also used GitLab where you could upload your, your compiled code or even have your, your pipeline compile the code. Uh, and then you could choose for any Uniface version Docker images. And we would not package the the UR in the Docker image itself, but we were able to do seamless updates that way that uh, once you start your container, it would fetch the, the compiled code at runtime and then run uh, your application. And we call it the, the SaaS enabler. So uh, we were thinking about uh, maybe exposing the, the code to run it yourself or maybe in the end the possibility could be that uh uniface could offer it as a uh SaaS itself okay now now you're making promises you're you no 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 i said so maybe just, yeah. maybe <laughs> uh, okay the, let, let's that's just... just something in that came up in the hackathon uh it was a nice thing to think about so uh, very good thank that's you. the stage it is nothing more than that thank you for your thoughts uh marlon well let's get back to the questions uh, from our audience uh they are asking about the performance testing and they are wondering, have we done anything? Have we tried it in, in the uh, microservices? Do we have an idea? Because they see some uh, calls to local content and being referenced that may be a problem in their experience. Uh, that's from Matt. Any ideas on performance testing? Have we done anything? No, but I could answer some questions just where I could think where some performance degradation could end up. That's a bit similar to the other questions uh, from would it uh, hit performance? Uh, so if you have lots of communication between the containers, uh, if that currently is on localhost because you're running the, bit, uh, the big monolith, uh, if your network is not fast enough, that could impact. Uh, that's one thing I see. Uh, and in the other performance, uh, if you read the, the documents, uh, the containerization comes at a tiny cost. I think the, in modern processors, uh, it's about 3% uh, performance uh, you lose when you containerize. Uh, but that are the two points I could think of. Okay. Thank you, Marlon. Uh, any thoughts on the performance test? Well, we know we haven't <laughs> done that, but... Uh... Yeah. But I mean, I, I don't see it being um, any less performant than using multiple virtual machines. In fact, it'll probably be more performant and almost certainly less resource hungry. Um, however, um, you know, the devil's in the detail. So, um, yeah, I, I can't say no and I can't say yes. I mean, it's absolutely dependent on, on individual points. Yeah. At the moment, I don't know. That brings me to, a different, to, an, to another question because um, one of the things were preparing this uh, blog that we sent out and getting some conversation with people, they were saying that uh, microservices are well suited for green field development. So when you're starting from nothing, but they were wondering if that was suitable for already existing, explicitly mentioned monolithic applications. What are your thoughts about that? Um, anyone wants yeah. to start? I would like Mark. to answer that. Um, you could take a sort of a hybrid approach. That's what I'd like. Uh, if you have a new feature that you can develop uh, separately from the rest, uh, you could try to connect that with the API. So you do a bit of work in your monolith to be able to connect to the new microservice and you can do your new development all in the microservice. So you could even think of having a part of on-premise and the rest already starting in the cloud if latency isn't that big of a problem. Okay. Mike, 
Um, so it, it, I don't see it as being um, just for greenfield development. You know, we've been talking about moving to a componentized um, deployment or development for quite a long time now. And a lot of customers have actually done that. And it's about finding um, how uh, you can split up your application. You you tend to find there's areas of functionality which you can encapsulate and then reuse. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't say you, you know, I would find areas in your application where it becomes useful to be able to do it and, you know, start there and, and then keep on going. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. It's it's mm -hmm. more that, and that's also the principle of domain-driven development, that you took, look at the areas where you can apply it, and the same mm -hmm. applies. And I know one of our customers is doing that when mm -hmm. they add a piece of functionality and they just did for their web mobile solution, and they consider that a suitable thing for moving to microservices, despite the rest being in a different architecture, but it's suitable mm -hmm. for that. But okay, thank you. Um, I have a very technical question about licensing and this, uh, does cloud lease licenses work uninterrupted? And I get that, oh, Mike. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I saw you thinking, so that's for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, cloud lease, you know, when, when you get a lease, that lease is for a period of uh, about 30, 60, 90 days. Um, and it basically becomes an offline license during that period of time. And if you are connected to the internet at uh, any particular point of time, uh, it will go and refresh that license for another 30, 60, 90 days or whatever it's going to be. Uh, so within that, that period of time, it is completely uninterrupted. Um, uh, if you get towards the end of your lease period and you haven't been connected to the internet, the Uniface will warn you that that's, that's what's happening and that you need to connect to the internet to be able to do it. Um, but yeah. Sorry, Mark, I realized this question was completely out of the topic, but yeah. okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. I thought it was cloud lease. Yeah. How does that match me? So it's just okay. Um, I, I would like to go to um, our third poll question just to see uh, what you're thinking. And it's the question is where do you consider that Uniface can assist you more in deploying your microservices? So if you can share your thoughts, we've been sharing some ideas you've been hearing from. Marlon and Mike, as well as you've heard from Herton and Alad, what we're thinking, just provide us some information. And I think this, this question will uh, give us some insight. On um, continuing on the, the development uh, of microservices, but now just looking at the side of the deployment, you mentioned there's some development uh, in the tools that can help. but. Do we need to consider anything else um, on, when, develop, uh, when developing a microservice from technology point of view, Marlon? That's a good question, uh, Jorge. Shall I route it to mine? <laughs> well, I can think of some, some technologies uh, and your architecture. You, you, make, you need to make good decisions from the start, uh, but that's not... Uh, only uh, centered to Uniface that's on uh, every application you start developing, of course. So, um, yeah, maybe Mike has a, a good answer as well. Um, no, I don't have anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, thank you. I think it's just to, to get any thoughts because now people are uh, considering microservices, developing and deploying the applications and what did they need to think about as uh, approaches like we just mentioned, looking at areas that you can use to be suitable for microservices. It does not necessarily need to be greenfield development. You can already extend your application or choose a part and just make it a microservice for scalability mm -hmm. reasons. So, so, so there are many areas and you mentioned the technology. So I think it's a very broad and interesting topic. And uh, maybe I could add one point. What, what could be very interesting if, if you have scaling issues and you see that you have to scale your whole application, maybe it's worth looking at that part. If you can already split that off and be more flexible in, in that scaling part, maybe something I could add. Okay. Oh, thank you. So look for your busiest points of the application. Yeah. 
and, and that, that would be the the ideal pl point to to uh, to add scalability. Yeah, and where you have also defined interfaces that you can mm -hmm. also make some. Uh, so th there are many thoughts. So this is well, um, and our audience came back with the answers. And interestingly enough, there is a, a neck to neck race between development guidelines and deployment facilities for developing uh, microservices. So. Mm -hmm slightly winning on the development side and, and we understand mm -hmm. that because we're a development environment and so it of course we are all facing that new challenge so um do you have questions for the audience uh, i mean <laughs> now the next question i i i have for for you guys is what did you think about the demo application what what would have you changed if you were to do it now, after you've prepared it. On the technical side, I, I, I wouldn't have changed anything because I think it, it is a, a good demo to show uh, that you can uni run Uniface as a microservice pretty easily. And I, I'm aware that this is a, a rather small application and it's a greenfield. So, uh, it still would be hard to make the transition from the monolith to a microservice. But uh, if I look back at the demo, I like the architecture. Uh, uh, there were lots of parts that weren't shown because it would be way too technical, but I was involved and uh, I liked the, the CICD part we implemented. Um, so yeah, what I want to give back to our viewers is that, uh, yeah, I think an orchestrator is the way to go. Uh, pipelines automate as much as possible. That's what I would say. Okay. Hi, right, Kenny. Um, so the, the only thing for me would be uh, services exec and using Uniface communication between some of the components. But I do understand that you know um, the integration, the testing. You know, we we have to go for you know the difficult stuff first. Um, so. Yeah. So, because services exec is a, is a very good existing alternative from Uniface yeah. that can be easily implemented. Yeah. No, I, I get your point. That's also <laughs> something that suits our viewers. So, um, I thought someone might make a comment about desserts because some people were <laughs> commenting they were expensive for seafood, but okay, let's forget about that. Let's but just. I move. think they were quantities. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's yeah. quantities. Okay. They were big desserts. <laughs> <laughs> or lots of them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, there is uh, um, another question, and in this kind of setup of microservices and its relationship with uh, big data for applications, would this suit an application using microservices and using big data? Would you combine those two? Would you use this as a gateway? And, and I'm filling in the gaps of what I read from the mm -hmm. question. Yeah, I know, for example, if you go to the major cloud providers again, they, they have excellent services for, for uh, big data. So uh, I don't think that it really matters if you have a microservice or the monolith, if you push big data into your big data cluster, if I look at that way, but if you need to process that data and it comes in in batches, I could well imagine that a microservice would be more suitable because you can scale it up more uh, quicker. So uh, again, if you have busy loads during the day or the evening, you scale up your microservice, you, you pull the big data, you parse it, you push it into your, I don't know, your Elasticsearch or some other, uh, maybe Hadoop or uh, all the technologies that are suitable yeah, that's my opinion. Okay. I would, I would use big data for big data and then use Uniface for interrogating it. So, yeah, if you got into something like a, uh, a NoSQL database, being able to use a UHTTP and being able to make the queries into them databases is pretty easy to do. We've got a couple of customers which are doing that very successfully. Um, so, yeah, I think you, yeah. Okay, very good. Now, one product related question, Mike. Uh, mm -hmm. They are asking us about if our. Do we have any plans to redirect the seeds logs to uh, from the containers somewhere else? Because that's something apparently is needed in container world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Um, so there, there are thoughts around that and we've had, um, we do a creative sprint and we've got um, ways of being able to, we're looking at ways of being able to consolidate logs or at least make them in a, in a way which is much more passable. So perhaps output them as JSON or, or some, something different. Um, but yeah, it's logging and, and, and debugging and uh, um, fault finding is something that's important. And when you increase the complexity of your your uh, your uh, infrastructure by having multiple containers, finding out where something's going wrong is something that um, you know if we can if you can make that easy, uh, really helps people. And maybe I you, can... you wanted to add something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, from an architectural point of view, uh, the way to go is to uh, like we discussed, if you have stateless uh, microservices or containers, you want those logs to be uh, centralized. So you could start small, maybe with a centralized uh, syslog server if you're running Unix, or you can, uh, if the JSON driver is ready, uh, you're looking at it, maybe you can some, use something like uh, Elk Stack, so Elasticsearch with Lostash and Kibana to centralize your logs. That's the current possibilities we're looking at uh, internally. I think just generally it's, it's um, try and get Uniface to, be able to uh, output in a format that the standard technology tools and technology are able to consume. Okay. Thank you. I, I have a very strategic question. Let me just call it that. Um, because now that we are talking about microservices and the approach we've taken, uh, they're asking us if uh, Rocket Software have pointed us into a, a direction of enabling or supporting, maintaining applications on in the old style or client server because they are also legacy any thoughts on on that or have we heard anything well i could say no but uh, <laughs> <laughs> i think that's the same answer you would have and yeah no. um no we we um you know we're we're still um in early days with rocket obviously um but at the moment you know they they've they've taken they you know uniface has become one of their, their product sets and they've done that for a reason um, and it's not to um, stop us from progressing um, and yeah so we, we are still looking at progressing and Rocket aren't pushing us in one way or another. Exactly no I, I would like to add on that uh, Rocket Software is trying to make legacy and that means it's also mm -hmm. enabling new technology in what we exist in existing applications so we are going our own way and you mentioned mm -hmm. it with the creative sprints and these things that we're doing this uh, webinar in itself mm -hmm. and the demos we're demoing so okay thank you for your answer mike um about data processing uh, do we need to consider anything special for microservices for data processing simply it's just an application isn't it about the only you know decision I think you have in there, or one of the decisions you have in there, is whether you break your database up along with the microservice, or whether the microservice is still using the, you know one single underlying database. But this is down to you know this is these patterns about how you handle your transactions, how do you split up your data? Is it just the logic on the layer on top which you are splitting up into your individual microservices, or are you you know you putting that split all the way down? And there's pros and cons for both, and there's reasons for both. Yeah, so you know that's something that you should really research about. You know what is best for you, and I don't think it's necessarily some. You know, it's not that you're going to start down one path, and that's the path that you're going to have to take. You know, Uniface makes it easy to be able to, to you know, change this uh, infrastructure at a later date. So, you know, you can change your mind and do it a different way. But you know, it, it's looking at uh, your application, what it does, uh, and what's best for you. Any thoughts? Yeah, you know, maybe your architecture might change here yeah, because your microservice has a different way of pulling the data uh, and inserting it somewhere. So maybe you have to think of something about scaling again. Uh, that's the only thing I have to add that might work different. If you, for example, in the in the current situation, you have one thread uh, processing the data. Maybe with microservices, you have five or four. You have to think of of locking issues, uh, something like that. That's something I could think of. Okay. Oh, very good. Thank you. Um, 
Now we're going into more product product management questions. Well, at least the next one, because with uh, what we said that we are rocket software has allowed us to continue what we're doing, mm -hmm. and the re the, although they recognize the legacy and they know it in, in us, they're asking, and there's a very specific question: Does that mean that our client server applications with Uniface will be supported for the coming five years? Is there any statement that we can make? Um, we have not had any conversations about the supporting client server. Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't, no, there's been no, no conversations around that at all. Um, but they're supported still, they're supported. Yeah. So, and they've been yeah. supported for a very long time. Yeah. So we're bringing, out, a mention. we're bringing out 10.4, uh, that certainly does have the client server. Yeah. Um, you know, there's no way we're going to do that in a patch. That would have to be a, a fairly major release. Um, but as I say, there's been no conversations around it at all. And, you know, we, we, we won't be leaving customers hanging like that. And, no. you know, Rocket would get really upset with us if we tried. And we've never done it in the Uniface <laughs> history, no. so that's no. why, why it's start now. No. Okay. So um, uh, one remark, I've been reading the questions and trying to relay them, but uh, all of them have been captured, and after this uh, webinar, we'll go through them and we'll post the questions mm -hmm. uh, in a Q&A. I forgot to mention that at the beginning, but you know, we will <laughs> we'll have all the answers to all the questions and remarks there. So uh, the, another question that's more for, are there any plans for Unifest to change to a more object-oriented uh, uh, approach or more components approach? In, in, in the sense, encapsulating data and adding functionality. Um, so we, you know, currently do components, uh, which allow you to be able to encapsulate your data quite well. You can have your public interface and your private interfaces, um, and, and they can deal with the data and they can, you know, you can have uh, instances of it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, about the only thing that we are looking, a big, fairly big topic, and that's around error handling and how we can simplify that. Um, uh, there's still ongoing discussions about um, how that might look. Um, so we've been talking, yeah. So at the moment, uh, there's no big changes to the way that we, uh, to the Uniface architecture. Um, but we, you know, we do look for ways of improving. Like I say, one of the big ways at the moment we're talking about is error handling. Okay, okay, no. Fair, fair, fair answer. We've been doing this component-driven development. Yeah. You have this approach yes. for years, so that's yeah. that's okay. Um, Marlon, I, I think this is a question suited for you. Okay. Uh, do you have any suggestion on the approach to take if you have an already existing client server application and you want to move to microservices? Mike earlier mentioned something like that, but now it's more, they, they try to get a more technical answer, yeah. but I think it's the same, but okay. <laughs> I'll give it to you. Well, uh, I would first look at, uh, from an architectural point of view, how you can split your application, uh, if it's doable. And if you have the split it out some, some components, which you can isolate, uh, you start splitting out your code uh, from the monolith and start building from there. Or Taking some parts and extending it or whatever. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, you <laughs> can keep the monolith. Mentioned. Like I mentioned before, you can keep the monolith, start working on one feature, pull that off, and, and yeah, various ways to uh, to do that. I just want to check how we're doing with time. So if we have more time for questions, yeah, we'll, yeah, then 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 we're fine. We'll continue with with the questions. Um, Uh, there, there's a question, very technical question, uh, very specific, I mean, not technical. Uh, question about listing in our supported matrix around remote desktop delivery. I don't understand exactly what they mean. Uh, think like AWS app, stream, or similar solutions associated with the cloud or in the cloud. Um, at the moment, we test uh, the... Uh, server-side functionality within AWS and Azure. Uh, you know, we we had to make sure that the Uniface product worked. Um, 
I we I think that what we would like to do is get to the point where we don't really specify and you know, we specify an operating system let's say windows or you or, or linux or or um solaris or whatever and not really worry about whether where it is being deployed whether that be uh in the cloud or whether it be on premise or whether it be in a docker container um so we, we'd like to get to the point where we're not actually listing each individual cloud provider or service provider you know and, and expect those guys to uh, have a support statement about, you know, do they support Windows desktop applications running in their environment? And if they support it, uh, then, you know, why should we say no? Exactly. Okay. Good point. Good point. Um, what are the next steps for us moving forward in Docker support, microservices, anything in the cloud? I'll start with you, Mike, as product manager, and then I'll go back. So, I mean, you know, the first thing that we need to do is to make sure that the product fully runs and is supported in a Docker in Docker containers, whether they're built by us or whether they're built by end customers. Um, you know, the, we do want to make it so that a Docker container is available within the cloud. Um, whether that comes, you know, we add support generally in the cloud or whether we support it first with custom uh, you know, homemade Docker containers. Um, that, you know, it depends on how close we are to being able to, de uh, to deploy in these kind of environments. You know, so if we can offer, you know, let's say giving extreme, you know, two years earlier by allowing the customers to do it themselves, then we should do. Um, if it comes with it, it's going to be, oh, it'll take us an extra week to do it. Well, we'll probably take that extra step and release into the into the uh, into the um, you know, the public repositories or, or stores. Um, we would also look at um, making sure that we explain how these containers can be used, um, how you can deploy your application into them, and how you can you can adequately scale it. Um, you know, that might be that there are you know, documentation that tells you how to do it. There could be samples on how to do it. There could be e-learning on how to do it. There could be, yeah. Uh, and at the moment, I know that the, the guys, and especially Marlon, et cetera, are working on, you know, making sure that there's blogs out uh, available in order to, and how to do it for when we, we put out that initial release. Yeah, Would you want to add anything? Mike already said most of it, <laughs> but uh, what we are currently also investigating, uh, we want to see if you scale up or down, if there is any uh, data loss, that's something we uh, certainly want to prevent uh, and base the best practices, like Mike said, uh, on that. So uh, we're also looking into load balancing, uh, mostly in the, in the popular cloud providers, how you could uh, seamless, uh, seamlessly uh, deploy to production, so without downtime. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the bit the next steps from the technical side, or the current steps even. Uh, there are other questions that I think they are more sales related, so mm -hmm. I will skip them or yes. more organization related because I don't think it's necessary. I, I would like to just round up and uh, thank you all. And thank you, Mike, for your answers. Thank you, Marlon, for your contribution. And I would like to uh, thank you all for participating with the microservices uh, discussion in Docker, uh, Docker uh, Uniface container, uh, Uniface microservices in containers, and I want to invite uh, Tom to do the closing remarks for this session. Okay, Jorge and uh, Marlon and uh, Mike, thank you very much for uh, sharing all this information. Uh, great questions from the audience, and mm -hmm. I was happy to see that not all the questions were about microservices, but also about other topics. So I think. Uh, People see this uh, webinar also as an opportunity to uh, yeah, raise their uh, questions about uh, anything else, particularly about uh, the client server future of Uniface, which is always dear to my heart, of course, because that, that's how we uh, got where we, we are. And I'm happy to see that uh, people are still uh, very enthusiastic about Uniface in, in that respect. And uh, I'm pretty sure we'll, yeah, as long as we will with Uniface, client server will be a supported uh, area of our product. So again, thank you very much. and. Um, of course, uh, thank you all uh, participants to uh, yeah, for sharing your questions um, with us. Um, again, like uh, Jorge said, uh, please keep on uh, sending those questions to us. We'll 
be in the chat for uh, for quite some time uh, until we've answered uh, most of them. If answering takes longer, we will get back to you uh, on an individual basis. And of course, um, yeah, all the information is very uh, valid for everybody here. So um, what we'll do is we'll this session has been recorded, of course, and we will send you a, a link uh, with all this information uh, later uh, this week when everything has been uh, wrapped up. Um, well, closing uh, remarks. Uh, thank you all for participating, and uh, I think uh, this was a very worthwhile, uh, uh, yeah, uh, two hours almost. Um, we will continue with the uh, online webinars. Uh, the next session will be, as already uh, announced, on uh, July the first. It's about uh, mobile uh, development, and uh, there will be an extensive demo and a customer case again of uh, building a, um, a mobile application with Uniface. Of course, also an area where, where things are changing um, rapidly, as a lot of in, in the IT world uh, these days. So a lot of uh, new uh, possibilities and technologies will be made visible uh, in, in those sessions. And of course, in the meantime, we are already preparing online sessions for after the summer period. And like I already said, we hope to, uh, to also to, to, to meet you face to face again. Uh, but in any way, we will have also uh, sessions um, with uh, a medium uh, like this. So. All in all, guys, uh, thank you very much for uh, being with us and uh, take care and uh, stay healthy. And we look forward to, to see you all on the, the July 1st. Um, and uh, have a great day. Thank you very much.